Here we're going to begin looking at the notion of sequences of functions. So let's see the setup. So for all natural numbers n, we have a function which we call f sub n. It goes from a to the real numbers and a is a subset of real numbers. Now here's a preliminary definition. The sequence f sub n converges pointwise to the function f, which is also a function from a to r, if for all x in a, we have the limit as n goes to infinity of f sub n evaluated at x equals f evaluated at x. Notice this evaluation of x on both sides means we're really taking the limit of numbers. In other words, this f sub n evaluated at x, that creates a sequence of just plain old numbers. Then we know everything about this, the limit of sequences of numbers from previous in the course. Okay, so let's look at some basic examples first, and then we'll look at maybe some more interesting examples. So the first example I wanna look at is, let's say we've got f of n equals the nth Maclaurin polynomial of f. So for example here, maybe if f of x equals one over one minus x, then we have um, f of one equals, so that's gonna be uh, one plus x, Notice it's the degree one Maclaurin polynomial. F sub two equals one plus x plus x squared. And in general, F sub n equals one plus x all the way up to x to the n. And then it's well known that this is going to converge to one over one minus x just by um, a, a straightforward like power series argument. And then furthermore, we know that this convergence happens pointwise at least on the interval of convergence for the Maclaurin series, which in this case is the unit interval minus one to one, not including either minus one or one. So maybe another example would be, let's take f of x equal to e to the x. And here we could have f of one is one plus x, f of two is one plus x plus one over two factorial times x squared. F sub three is one plus x plus one over two factorial x squared plus one over three factorial x cubed, and then so on and so forth. So here we have f sub n um, of x is equal to, maybe we could write this as the sum m goes from zero to n of x to the m over m factorial. Good. So maybe these are like kind of straightforward examples. Notice in this case, we have f sub n of x approaches um, f of x, which is equal to the e to the x for all x in the real numbers because we've got an infinite radius of convergence here. So I'll go ahead and get rid of this and then we'll look at some examples that you would not have seen in like a calculus two type class. So for our first example, we're gonna look at this sequence of functions f sub n, which are defined by f sub n of x equals one over n times x squared plus nx. And now what I wanna notice is that for all x in the real numbers, we have the limit as n goes to infinity of one over n times x squared plus nx. Well, that's gonna be equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of x squared over n plus x. But because this is like some fixed real number in terms of the limit, i.e. this is a constant with respect to the limit, as n goes to infinity, this thing is gonna go to zero because it'll all, always charge past whatever x value we're at at that moment. And so we get in the end here that uh, this limit is just x. So in other words, this sequence of functions converges to the function f where f of x equals x. And this is true for all real numbers x. And by this definition over here, this uh, convert... <clears throat> and in line with this definition over here, we would say that this type of convergence is pointwise. Good. So now let's go ahead and look at another example. So for my next example, uh, let's call it g of n, and this is gonna be the nth root of x, 
and we're viewing this as a function from the closed interval 0, 1 to the real numbers, although it's not too hard to see that this goes on to the interval 0, 1 as well. Okay. Good. What's interesting about this sequence of functions is that it has a slightly different behavior depending on if you are in a different part of this closed interval. So maybe let's look at the simplest case first. So let's notice that if we set x equal to zero, so, no, so in other words, we look at the limit as n goes to infinity of g of n evaluated at zero. So that's gonna be the limit as n goes to infinity of the nth root of zero but that's the limit of the constant sequence, which is just all zeros, and so that's clearly equal to zero. Great. And then maybe some intuition from calculus one would tell us what happens to this limit if you are not equal to zero. So let's maybe go ahead and just write that down in a box over here. So intuition from calc one, would tell us that the limit as n goes to infinity of the nth root of x is going to be equal to one if x is in this half open interval zero to one, not including one. And so I'll let you think about why that would be the true, but let's, let's just think about maybe um, the number one over 81. So if we take the square root of one over 81, we get one over nine. Notice that's getting bigger. If we take the fourth root of one over 81, we're gonna get one over three. That's gonna get even bigger. And then if we like keep going, well, that's just gonna charge up towards one. So that's our intuition for this limit of the other values of this sequence of functions. Now we'll provide a little proof of this intuitive fact from calculus one. So let's go ahead and do that. We're gonna use the epsilon n definition of a limit. So let's say that we are given some arbitrary epsilon bigger than zero. Then let's fix our x in the interval uh, zero to one, but not including zero. So like I said, that's kind of the rest of the domain of this function g of n that we're interested in. And then, well, I won't go through the details because that's not really the thrust of this video, but we need to find a capital N that makes some inequality satisfied. So finding the capital N in this case is a bit tricky, but what it boils down to is taking a capital N bigger than one over x times epsilon. Okay, so given the fact that x is between zero to one and epsilon is generally a really, really small number, if we put both of those in the denominator, then we're gonna end up with a pretty big number. But that's kind of what we should feel like we should have because this n should be fairly large in order to make our inequality work. Okay, so we've taken our capital N value, and now let's go ahead and suppose that we have a little n bigger than or equal to this capital N. And notice to finish it off, we want to show the following inequality, and that inequality will be one minus the nth root of x is less than epsilon. Notice I didn't need absolute values here because I put these in the correct order so that we had a positive number. So notice one is always going to be bigger than or equal to the nth root of x given that x is coming from this half open interval right here. Okay, great. So now what we're gonna do from here is do some equivalent operations on this inequality until we have something that is like obviously true based on this assumption of our capital N here. So maybe the first thing that I wanna do is notice that this is equivalent to saying one is less than epsilon plus the nth root of x. But the next what I can do is maybe raise each of those to the nth power and that makes another equivalent inequality of one is less than epsilon plus the nth root of x all to the nth power. But now we can use the binomial theorem to expand that. So that's gonna be equal to x plus n choose one 
um, epsilon times the nth root of x to the n minus one, but that's the same thing as x to the n over n minus one plus more terms. Good. But now, notice that we can just get rid of the more terms if we put an inequality in there. And then furthermore, x to the n over n minus 1 is going to be less than x. So again, that's like um, something that would have been shown earlier in the course. So all of this is going to be less than x plus n choose 1, so that's going to be n, times epsilon times x. But then by our choice of capital N and the fact that little n is bigger than or equal to capital N, we know that this bit right here is going to cancel off this epsilon times N and give us something that is larger. So this is going to be bigger than X plus 1. And so let's see what we have. We have our goal inequality right here has been shown to be equivalent to this inequality which says that one is less than x plus one. But that is trivially true given the fact that we're taking x on the half open interval zero to one, not including zero. Okay, so in other words, we finished the proof of this intuition right here. Okay, so maybe I'm gonna go ahead and clean up this proof and then we'll make a little summary of this problem. Okay, so as a quick summary of this second example, we had g of n evaluated at x was the nth root of x. We saw that g of n could converge pointwise to this function g, and the function g had a piecewise definition. So it was equal to zero if x was zero, and it was equal to one if x was not equal to zero. In other words, if it was on the half open interval zero to one. And this is maybe the first hint that something weird is happening with sequences of functions because each of these GNs are continuous on this closed interval 0 to 1, but the limiting function, or I should say the pointwise limiting function, is discontinuous at x equals 0. So we've got a sequence of continuous functions which becomes a discontinuous function. Okay, so I'm going to clean up the board and we're going to look at another example. So for our last example, we're going to look at the following sequence of functions. So we'll call them f sub n, and f sub n of x is going to be x to the 2n over 2n minus 1. And here we're going to think about the domain as being this closed interval minus 1 to 1. And we can actually use the results of our last example to get an idea for what this does pretty easily. So let's go ahead and notice that we can write f sub n of x as x times x to the 1 over 2n minus 1 like that. So that's pretty clear because we've got x to the 1, and then x to the 1 plus that is going to give us a 2n in the numerator right there. Okay, good. Now what I want to notice <clears throat> is that this function itself is pretty interesting. So let's maybe think about this function on its own. We'll call this h of n h sub n of x. So this is going to be x to the 1 over 2n minus 1. So I want to point out that on the closed interval 0 to 1, we know exactly what this thing does because it is a subsequence of our last example. And so we have h sub n converges to h, where h of x equals 0 if x is 0, and it's going to be equal to 1 if x is on this half open interval 0 to 1. And again, that's because this h sub n is a subsequence of our previous example. And then on the interval minus 1 to 0, we can essentially do the same kind of thing. So we have h sub n converges to h 
where h of x equals zero if x is equal to zero, and it's gonna be equal to negative one if x is on the half open interval minus one to zero, where again, we don't include zero there. And that's because in this interval, this guy is just gonna be the negative version of what it is up here. This is an odd function. Okay, good. Now putting this together with our sequence of functions f sub n, we see the following. So the sequence of functions f sub n converges to the function f, where f of x is equal to, so we can use this piecewise definition here. So it's gonna be x times this version of h of x on the interval zero to one, and it's gonna be times this version of h of x on the interval um, negative one to one. What, but what that boils down to is that it's gonna be equal to x if x is bigger than or equal to zero, and negative x if x is less than zero. But notice we have a name for that, and that's the absolute value function. And so what's really important here is that all of these functions right here are differentiable, but the limit is not differentiable at zero. So in the previous example, we saw that continuity was not necessarily preserved in the pointwise convergence of a sequence of functions. And here what we see is that maybe continuity is sometimes preserved, but differentiability may not be preserved in the pointwise convergence of a sequence of functions. So what we have going on here is both of those properties might be conserved, like in the very first example, or only continuity is conserved, like this example, or neither continuity nor differentiability is conserved, like the previous example. So that really shows us the need for some notion of convergence of a sequence of functions that is different or maybe stronger than pointwise convergence for sequences of functions. And that's what we'll do in the next video. And that's a good place to stop.